This episode's made possible by Planful. Hi, this is Chris Kramer, CFO at Exonius, and you are listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 949. And then there was a lot of work. There was a lot of work around reconciling, you know, kind of other people of data set to where we are. There was some education, right? Very early on, what I said was, look, guys, you run your function how you want to run it. I'm not telling you what data to use, but you're going to have to reconcile back to me because this is what's going to get reported to the C-level, to the board, to investors. And, you know, if you can't talk to these numbers, you know, that, that that's going to be a problem to deal with. So, I, you know, I think very quickly people realize that that's the right data set to align around. And then there was a lot of work. There was a lot of work around reconciling, you, you know, kind of other people's data sets to where we are. This is episode 949. Phenom CFO Davinder Athwal tells us that he has a personal connection to his company's mission. Near the beginning of our talk, he shares a story about his father, a highly skilled executive who once struggled to find a job in the UK. This personal experience fuels his passion for Phenom's mission to help a billion people to discover the right work. It's not just finding a job, it's about finding the right job that matches skills with aspirations, as CFO Athwal is eager to tell us. You'll hear that story and much more on today's episode. We'll begin after this. Hi, I'm Rowan Tonkin, Chief Marketing Officer at Planful and we're a proud sponsor of CFO Thought Leader. At Planful, we're empowering teams just like yours to drive peak financial performance in every corner of your business. What sets Planful apart? We have purpose-built applications for every department, from FP&A to accounting, marketing to HR, all with built-in financial intelligence. This means we can get you up and running within weeks, and it requires minimal IT involvement. So you can rapidly and seamlessly engage everyone across the business in your key financial processes. Best of all, you can't outgrow us. We take the pain of growing away with an unmatched ability to scale with you. You have an endless runway with Planful. See why over 1,300 customers around the world choose Planful as their flexible, user-friendly, end-to-end financial performance management platform. Go to planful.com and see how you can make financial performance a team sport in your business. Hello, we're speaking with Davinder Athol, CFO of Phenom. Davinder, welcome. Uh, how, how are you? Welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Jack. Doing really well. I'm excited to uh, talk to you today. Well, as always, we're going to ask you to look back and try to identify some of those experiences, Devinder, that you feel prepared you to become a finance leader. What would come to mind for you? Well, you know, Jack, you know, there's multiple pathways to, to becoming a CFO. And if I think about my own pathway, it's probably been a combination, I'd say, of luck, some some planning, uh, a willingness to always go that extra mile and just a lot of hard work, you know, quite frankly. Uh, if I deconstruct that journey that got me here, there's probably like three kind of key phases that I would call out, um, you know, more, more so than a singular experience along the way. Um, and that first one would be a foundational stage, right? So I began my career with PwC out in Silicon Valley, think mid-90s, dot-com boom. Uh, just a ton of excitement around IPOs, kind of changing the world with the internet and things like that. And at the time, I was lucky enough to actually join that business when, you know, they were at the forefront of that, right? So I had a chance to kind of work with some great companies, some that you may have heard of, things like eBay and Yahoo and DoubleClick, uh, as well as a whole host of others that have since kind of fallen by the wayside. But, you know, I learned very early on there how to work basically with high high growth, high tech companies that were on this pathway to to basically getting to an IPO and beyond that. Um, so that, that kind of is what built that awareness of kind of what finance does, what the value of finance is, and maybe what the value of a good CFO is. I uh, did that for about nine years, and then after that decided that I didn't want to make my, my lifetime there. 
And then I got to this next phase, which I'd call the branching out phase, right? So my core domain expertise in the first nine years was really around accounting, auditing, governance, and those sorts of things. You know what I what I did next in that in that branching out phase was kind of branch out into FP&A, into Treasury, M&A, um, and all the other kind of components that make up a kind of a well-rounded finance uh, profile, if you will. And then the last stage that that I would call out would be what I call the preparation stage. Um, and this is where you basically get invited into the room where decisions are being made, you know, whether or not you should do an acquisition or you should buy versus build or should you lease versus, uh, you know, buy out rate or should you do the outsourcing versus, you know, all those kind of decisions that I think are really critical from a value creation perspective. Kind of being invited into that room is, is kind of the first step to that. But then the other part of that is finding a good CFO or a CEO sponsor who's willing to kind of take you under their wing, mentor you, uh, and really are committed to helping you kind of become a CFO. And I was able to kind of do that. And, you know, when I think about how I got here, that really was the trajectory more so than any kind of singular experience. Can I can I uh, share a few comments on your your early years? Here you are in Silicon Valley. You had the option of going to oh, so many of these dot-com startups, but you held out and you leave in 2003 after – you know, Enron, after a lot, you've seen a lot of disasters. So maybe it taught you a lesson. Maybe you thought, I'll go to IBM. What would you tell us? Yeah, I, I think you hit it on the right on the head there, Jack. So, you know, as I was winding up my time at PwC in Silicon Valley, the last few engagements that I had were really forensic engagements. So there were a number of companies that had gone public, flown high, and then crashed and burned, right? So I kind of saw that entire life cycle from not only the excitement of a new startup, scaling up, going public, but then also on the other end of it, how they kind of you know ran, ran aground, if you will, in some ways. And that, that did kind of give me the sense of, you know, this might not be something I want to bank my entire career on because, you know, it, it did have a little bit of a feeling of it's a bit of a hit or miss. Um, and, you know, at the time, as I thought about how do I want to, make that transition into industry, made sense to go somewhere that was solid, stable. Um, you know, certainly IBM has one of the, I would say, premier finance programs in the country, along with PG&E, GE, you know, a few others like that. So the idea of like going to a place that was really at scale, learning what good looks like was, was appealing to me at that time. Now, when you join IBM, do you remain in the Bay Area? I mean, I imagine they have a San Francisco or San Jose office that you join. I actually ended up with IBM at the corporate headquarters in Armonk, New York, um, and that's because the, the group that had gone into was really corporate strategy or corporate development, and they all sat in Armonk, right? So it's an opportunity to kind of get, get to the East Coast. That's what brought me to the East Coast from, from the West Coast, uh, but that that's where the concentration was. So, you know, you, you could say it was a real cultural shock, right, kind of going from Silicon Valley into, you know, kind of the Northeast classic traditional kind of a company. Um, but in a way, it was refreshing. You know, it was good to see uh, a business, again, that that's very well regarded, you know, a, a great brand. Um, certainly the way they went about doing things is very methodical, is very disciplined. Again, very unlike Silicon Valley, where you tend to fail fast, you try things out. IBM, you know, the other good thing about IBM was that they had already probably tried most things out. So you got a chance to kind of tap into that expertise and maybe 100 years worth of experience, you know, that that exists in that organization. When you do leave IBM, you go to a, another large company, uh, Nortel, and, 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 then, and then you opt for a midsize company. Am I right about that? Yeah, no, you're right about that. You know, and, and even though the midsize company was outside of technology, right, it was in energy. Uh, but I joined those guys late 2008. If you can kind of go back in that time, you'll you know recall new administration, a lot of excitement around what the energy industry could do around renewables and things like that. So there were a number of energy companies that were thinking about, well, how do we survive in this new world, right? Because they had been around basically as utilities for 50 plus years. You can map those things out. It's very predictable and very... Uh, you know, you just just you just know what's going to happen, and now you've got this kind of ability to run business in a different way in a very call it deregulated environment, in a much more around uh, entrepreneurial and things like that. So a number of these companies are actually looking for folks from the uh, tech industry because the thinking was that tech people know how to handle disruption, they know how to handle 
uncertainty and can you bring some of that that expertise so i, I joined the mid-size company it was a fortune 500 but it's a mid-size company uh with the idea of helping them kind of build out their portfolio of renewables and things like that yeah can we uh, mention the name of it is there you know ugi i, I mean uj yep yeah, uj corporation it, um, as we look at your career years, you're someone who, okay, you made an investment at Price Waterhouse. You made an investment at UGI. What kept you there? You know, the way I looked at my career, both of those two places, Jack, was, you know, every year, as long as I was, long as I was learning and growing, I was okay staying. Um, and when that wasn't the case, I left. Right now, if, if you kind of go back and look at my career, what you find is, Long stint at PwC, a long stint at uh, UGI, kind of shorter stint so at Nortel and IBM. And the reason for that was because, you know, take IBM to begin with, huge organization, trying to distinguish yourself and trying to get to that next level. It, it's a journey. Right? I remember having a conversation with my boss after about probably two or three years at IBM and saying, how do I get to the next level? The next level for me would have been a director, right? I was a senior manager at the time. Director was considered to be an executive rank. And the response is basically, you're doing everything right, keep on doing it. Okay, great. For how long? About five years, right? And I said, look, I'm a patient guy, but th- I'm not that patient. So, so that that's what took me to uh, to Nortel. And the other part of that move actually was around trying to get different experiences, right? So as you mentioned, you know, did the startup scene in Silicon Valley, did the Fortune 10, very stable scene at IBM. And when I went to uh, Nortel, they were in a turnaround situation. So this is after all that accounting, uh, you know, excitement they had in the late, I guess, 90s, you know, early 2000 time frame. And they had five material weaknesses that they were trying to clean up. So they were trying to re- basically you know, reinvent themselves. So it was an opportunity to go there and be a part of that. It was, a, you know, that, that was the thinking behind it. Yeah. And then as you, as you advance, when are you... When, when do you set your sights on the CFO office? When is it that you think, yes, I want to become a CFO? What's the right type of company for me? Let me think about this. Do I want to spend another, you know, invest another 10 years in another company uh, before I, I get the nod? Don't know. You know, what is your thinking as you move forward? Yeah, you know, th- that's an interesting question because I'm not sure I ever really kind of train my sights on the, on the role itself. Right. So I'd always kind of gone through my career of saying, as long as I'm learning, as long as I'm growing and excited about what I'm doing, I'm OK. You know, and, and it kind of the way it worked out for me was when I went to UGI, I kind of began to be the CFO, you know, more and more without the title until some point in time where somebody kind of walked up and thought, yeah, you know, we're going to make you a CFO of the international unit because you're already doing all the stuff that we would need. So I kind of like, you know, almost sleepwalked into it, if you will, right? Um, you, you know, but, you know, in retrospect, looking back, you know, I'm not sure I would do anything differently, you know, other than maybe accelerate, may, maybe a little less time at PwC, maybe a little less time at UGI. But short of that, you know, I mean, I think the pathway was probably, in retrospect, the right one to, to get to the seat. Now, when you do enter the CFO office, we're curious if it was a, a given what you just shared, was it a recruiter who, who kind of planted the seed and, and said, you know what your next move has to be? Um, one would think that would be a conversation that you might have as an international CFO of, of that unit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so the international unit CFO was within UGI, right? So at this point, the company had done a lot of acquisitions and grown tremendously. That became the, the second largest business unit in, in the business. And there was a desire by the CEO and the board to basically bring in professional management. So we hired a CEO. They asked me to be his CFO. That that's basically how I ended up in that role. Uh, and then the role always was designed to basically, you know, be done from the U.S., set up in Europe, and then basically, you know, a local person would take over. And at that point, I would be out of that role. And that's exactly what happened on plan. I think to your point, Jack, you know, what happened though was at the end of that three-year stint, I had to ask myself the question, which is, do I want to stay? at UGI and hang around for the number one spot, which is the enterprise CFO role, or do I do something different? And that is where a recruiter did begin to reach out. There's a number of recruiters that are reaching out, but one in particular that stood out, which is an opportunity to get back into technology, be an enterprise CFO in a public company. So that that's basically kind of all that came together. And it felt like uh, now if I was going to leave UGI, that was the right, the right opportunity to leave for. 
All right. Well, we, we uh, have you landing in the CFO office. Um, we, we might have a few more career-related questions for you a little later uh, in the podcast, but right now let's find, about, find out about Phenom. Tell us about this company. Yeah, I'd love to do that. So I'll start by saying, you know, all of us at Phenom, you know, are really passionate about the mission of the company. The company's mission is to help a billion people discover the right work. Um, and I would say that most of us are here because, you know, we've had somehow experienced when that hasn't happened, either to us directly or to people that we know, right? And, and this is the reason I actually joined this company, because I saw this happen with my dad. Uh, just to kind of backtrack and give you a bit of context there, right? So my parents emigrated to the UK from India uh, in, in the late 60s. And in India, my dad was in the military. He was trained as an engineer uh, in a new, exciting, emerging field at the time, you know, electronics and communications. And as he was thinking about his own transition from the military into civilian life, he was in really hot demand in India, right? So there's a bunch of people that are like literally tripping over each other to hire him. And he had assumed that that same dynamic would hold true when he went to the UK, right? Now, he gets to the UK, and unfortunately, that's not how things planned out, or panned out at all. You know, once he got there, he found he couldn't even get a job, you know, or a response to kind of all the applications that he was making, which kind of makes you wonder kind of what, what happened, right? I mean, you went from this hot commodity to like someone that's, you know, basically not a, a non a non-entity all of a sudden, uh, yeah, highly unlikely that it was the technology was different because all the technology trained on and used was either from the U.S. or from the U.K., so that couldn't really have been the reason. You know, more likely what happened is that employers at the time in the U.K. were using proxies to assess his skills and his suitability for the work that they needed to get done. And unfortunately for my dad, he just didn't go to a school that they recognized, and he hadn't worked at any brand that they recognized. Um, and probably on top of all of that, the only Indians they knew at the time in the UK were kind of typically manual factory workers and probably had a you know kind of a strong accent. So so all in all, you know, just just a very unusual candidate for the type of job that he was applying for. Now, I would say the right work for my dad, you know, at that time was actually to do what he was trained to do, loved to do, and had done for years at a very proficient level, and you know, to the point where people's lives literally depended on him doing it right. And had the companies in the UK that he's applying to you know, use those kind of, you know, skill assessment tools to figure out if he was a good fit or not, I think he would have been in a very different situation and his life could have been very different. So Phenom's mission is to change all of that, right? And in plain English, what we do, Jack, is we basically develop technology, uh, that that's pattern recognition technology, and you can use that to basically match candidates with jobs. You can use that to help employees identify where their skill gaps are and how they can grow and develop their own careers. And finally, you can look at entities uh, that can look at where their skills gaps are for the work that they need to get done. And maybe just to you know, double click on that, the way that works, uh, you, you take any individual, right? Take me, for instance. Um, you go look at my LinkedIn profile. I've probably got, I don't know, 15, 20 skills listed on there. Uh, but in reality, I actually have about 100, like like everybody else that does my job, right? We just don't have the others top of mind all the time. Uh, but those are all essential to kind of getting the job done, right? Um, and what our technology is able to do is actually infer those skills, right? So the technology will take what you do, your job title, who you did it for, how long you did it for, uh, as well as like this database that we've been building over the last 10 years. And we can basically infer the balance of those 100 skills, we can do the same thing for jobs. You take, think about a typical job description. There may be 10, you know, kind of requirements that are listed on there. Uh, reality is for a knowledge-based job, there's anywhere from 50 to 75 actual requirements to do that job proficiently. So when you think about these two kind of inferred skill sets, we call those talent graphs. And what we do for our customers, we kind of pattern match the two. And we're looking for candidates that have a 75% or better match on those two graphs, and we offer them up as candidates. Um, you know, one of the things that I would say makes us better at this than anybody else is we'll do that at the 75% match, uh, whereas we've got you know, others in the field that might do this at like 40%, right? So our, I'd say our technology, our data uh, is actually better, which allows us to do that. Now, can, can you maybe uh, give us a, a short history of uh, Phenom's capital structure and, and how old a company is this? Yeah, company's about 10 years old in its present incarnation. There was a, a prior, you know, kind of an app development company that became Phenom. Uh, but if you look at Phenom, the way it's kind of presently constructed, it's about 10 years old. Uh, we, we did a Series D around a financing in 2020. 
Um, so, you know, it's very typical sort of startup where you've got a cap table of a seed investor who actually was the founder of a company called Connexa that got sold to IBM a number of years ago. So he's kind of very, very big in this space. Uh, he was a seed founder. Then we had it kind of your typical names that came in, you know, with the other round. We have Sierra Ventures. We've got AXA. We, we've got, uh, you know, a number of other folks that are kind of more later stage. Uh, but that that's kind of how we've kind of funded the company to date. Now, you stepped in uh, early last year, I suppose, to the CFO office there. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you, you know, have you reorganized finance in some way? What, what have you uh, made your, your milestones for what you want to achieve? Yeah. So, so at this point, um, I've been appointed as the new finance leader a number of times. So they have like, a, you know, a science to how do you, how do you kind of transition in. Um, and the first lesson I would share is to resist the temptation to kind of move too quickly with making changes, right? I've seen people do that. I've probably been guilty of doing that myself, and you kind of end up doing things that you might regret later on. So, so what I like to do, what I suggest is starting with a 100-day plan. You know, for kind of the work of transitioning into a new leadership role r- r- works for you for anything, but particularly for finance. And I would say out of that 100 days, the way I chunk it up is, you know, take the first, at least the first 30 days, just dedicate that to learning the business, you know, the people, the culture, you know, what are the power structures? What, what are the, you know, there's so much to learn when you come in, you know, that's not related to your own hard skills, but just around the new entity that you're in, that it becomes super critical to just to learn all that stuff. You know, when I was at IBM, one of the things they used to teach us, you know, where they, where I really began to kind of learn how to do this stuff was when you're going into a new organization and they already meant within the IBM ecosystem, think about yourself as a virus, right? And everybody else in that, in that entity is kind of like the, uh, you know, they're, they're going to kind of attack you because you're the outside cell, right? So you've really got to take that mindset. Um, so first 30 days, just kind of go in and don't try and make any changes, learn about the, you know, the place that you're going to be in. And then I'd say, you know, at, at the end of that, you're going to begin to kind of form some hypotheses about what needs to change. It could be organization, it could be process, it could be technology, whatever it is. Uh, but I would say, you know, spend the next 30 days after that really kind of testing those hypotheses with people. Because there's a lot of times where, you know, you may have a great idea, but you go in and you ask somebody, hey, why are you doing this the way you're doing it? And there may be a very good reason why they're doing it. That could be constraints. They may have tried your idea. So, again, I, I just find that that's a really valuable way to kind of learn about what might work or might what might not work. After that, you know, spend a couple of weeks, say 15 days on kind of like, you know, making your proposal as to what changes you want to have and make and what that execution plan looks like. And then the last, you know, 25 30 days is all about selling those ideas to the stakeholders because you shouldn't assume that just because you've come in as a CFO, you're going to, you know, get immediate buy-in. In fact, a lot of times you don't, even though people may kind of, you know, nod their heads as if they agree with you. So there's a, a very critical step to, to kind of selling your ideas. I did exactly that when I got here, uh, Jack, you know, as, I, as I've used that playbook a number of times. And what I found is that the structure of the organization is actually okay for where we are at this stage of our our life cycle. Uh, you know, where we do did need to make some changes, though, is much more around kind of tethering the financial plans and the finance, the financial numbers, if you will, to the overall strategy of the business. So that wasn't very clearly articulated or even, you know, very close. Improving forecast accuracy is another one. And then the final one, I think, was really around just raising the profile of finance as a true business partner, right? So it really was seen as much more of an accounting governance function as opposed to, hey, this is a function that we can use to help drive the business forward. So so that that's kind of what I've been working on for the last uh, kind of 18 months or so. As you, as you look to drive the business and become less of a, a governance structure, perhaps, uh, mm. What what um, metric or number have you sought to uh, sort of raise the profile of with the uh, with management and with managers? What is it that uh, yeah. perhaps you 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 realize needed to be talked about more broadly? Don't know anything. Yeah, no, I, a great question. So in our business, uh, we're basically enterprise software, right? So the key metric that really matters is customer acquisition cost. Because as, you, as you're as you aware, with these businesses, once you bring a customer in and you retain them, it becomes basically, you know, kind of a, a money-making machine, right, which is great. So all the effort really is in, is in acquiring that customer. So, so what I've done since I've been here is really put a, a huge emphasis on customer acquisition cost. 
and you know, really at a granular level, right? Not just at the overall enterprise level. It's by channel. It's by salesperson. It's by uh, f function within sales and marketing. Just to kind of look at it every way we can, and then tie that back to lifetime value, right? Because what you want to do is you want to make sure that whatever you're paying out, you know, to acquire a customer, you're actually getting enough of a return on it. And I'm looking for a three to four x on on a, in every dollar of CAC that I'm spending. So so those are kind of the two the two metrics that I've really you know kind of try to expound as being critical to our success. There have a number of other things that flow from that. You know, you might have heard things like the magic number, the sales efficiency, all that kind of stuff. But ultimately, they all kind of go around right to that. Now, the other thing I'd say along with that, though, is that when you're trying to measure, when I'm trying to measure customer acquisition cost and LTV and things like that, yeah, traditional accounting measures, they're, they're, they kind of come up short a lot of times, right? Because if I just go by, for instance, gross margin, uh, which in my case, you know, is is basically um, 75 to 80 percent of what we do. I'm going to miss a lot of the cost that goes towards kind of, you know, basically, you know, really serving a customer. So what I like to do is I like to kind of already get to what's the cost, not, not just the cost of acquisition, but then what's the cost of serving that customer. And to do that, what I like to do is kind of basically build up. Uh, you know, my own set of uh, P&Ls, if you will, around, you know, starting with that gross margin, which is direct cost, then taking indirect costs, finding out some way of allocating all of that indirect cost to to each customer, almost like an activity-based, you know, uh, accounting system, if you will, and like just rank ranking them from, from the most profitable to the least profitable. I like to do the same thing for product as well. And then you end up with kind of double Pareto, right, of kind of best to worst. And the insights from that are amazing. You know, the number of times I've seen customers that people believe are profitable simply because of the brand that they have, the amount they're using us, or you know, just the amount of volume they're taking up. Uh, but they're never the most profitable, right? And it becomes very interesting to, to, to kind of see that. So one of the things we did after we, we set that up was we actually set up a deal desk so that as new deals come in, we can basically look, you know, stack rank them against that, that double parade and figure out, well, how interested are we in this, in this work, for instance. Um, so that that contribution margin, you know, around the cost to serve model has been a really good, you know, way for us to look at the business. You mentioned you were hoping to step up uh, forecast accuracy as well. H how are you doing there? You know, we, we're we're hitting my goals. Uh, you know, my goal is to be plus or minus, ultimately plus or minus two percent. Uh, we're probably running right now, year to date, at about plus or minus five percent. So we're we're, we're kind of getting there quite a bit. And yeah, you know, a lot of that just goes to. Quite frankly, you know, having the right granularity of data and really comes down to assumptions, right? Um, there's a tendency sometimes in finance to, you know, put the best, uh, you know, kind of picture on things. What I found over time, though, is, you know, you're better off kind of having a bad assumption and a good outcome as opposed to, you know, the other way around where your assumption is too, 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 too aggressive and you can't meet it in some way. So it's a combination of both those two things. You know, many finance leaders have told us as they come through the door, they really want to get a fix on the, the company's data strategy. And they want to make sure the data, you know, data integrity issues are are in the past, in the rear view, if there were any. Uh, but what, what would you tell us as you come through the door or steps you've taken to understand better and get a fix on the company's data data strategy? Yeah, actually, a great question again, Jack. So, you know, one of the issues that we had, not unlike many other companies, I suspect, of our size or maybe even much larger than us, was you had these kind of silos of data and you're trying to reconcile them. And you never can because, you know, they get disconnected. There's different kind of, you know, inputs and things like that. So the first thing I think you got to do is you've got to get to a single source of the truth. And, and I believe it's finance, right? And the reason I believe it's finance is because ultimately when you're communicating to the outside world or your own investors or board, you know, that's the only data that really counts, right? So very early on, what I said was, look, guys, we got to get to, you know, I don't really, you, you run your function how you want to run it. I'm not telling you what data to use, but you're going to have to reconcile back to me because this is what's going to get reported to the C-level, to the board, to investors. And, you know, if you can't talk to these numbers, you know, that, that that's going to be, you know, a, a different problem to deal with. So, I, you know, I think very quickly people realize that that's the right data set to align around. And then there was a lot of work. There was a lot of work around reconciling, you know, kind of other people's data sets 
to where we are, there is some education, right? So people sometimes get, you know, into habits of doing things the way either they like to do them or the way that it maybe best presents what they're trying to present. Whereas I like to think of finance as being the objective, you know, kind of neutral arbiter. Uh, but now we're, we're there now, right? So we're no longer, you know, I mean, six months ago still, we were probably having conversations about, well, how do we reconcile from that number to this number? But now we're at a point where everybody knows that the only number that counts is finance, right? So so that, that, that's a starting point. Um, it, you know, and you, you get into issues, though, for instance, you know, a great one is if I think about uh, my bookings number, which is a financial metric, and I try – and tie that back to, let's say, the sales force number, which is all based on opportunities, there's a disconnect there. Right now, the sales guys, they need to run opportunities, I but I can't do anything with opportunities. I can't, I, I can't report on those, right, because most of them end up going nowhere. But, you know, we've now got a process where basically, you know, every month we actually do that reconciliation to make sure that we can reconcile between the two. And that causes other problems, right? Because if you think of our pipeline, uh, we had many people kind of, you know, filling our pipeline. They all had different definitions because the data that they were using were all aligned now. So again, a, a very good call out on, on just that point to, to get alignment across the organization. Yeah, thanks for that. I wondering about too, whether your finance team, have you deployed them any differently? Have you looked at, and you said you wanted to, of course, make them, more of a partnering uh, approach with the organization. Um, but did you deploy people differently? Did you, or was it more like changing the mindset of, of the uh, the executives? What would you tell us? Yeah, pr- pretty combination, right? So, so it starts with actually really understanding what expectations are of finance. And what I found, like if I go back to that 100-day plan in that first 30 days, one of the things I'll do is I'll make a point of meeting with all the key sto- stakeholders that, that use finance in some way and asking them, hey, what, what are your expectations? What do you think finance should be doing? And, you know, what would you recommend that we keep on doing? What do you recommend we stop doing? Uh, what would you like us to, you know, start doing? And that becomes a very valuable source of kind of like that that starting point of like just alignment, right? And it's amazing the number of things that people think finance should be doing. And that's a great time to say, well, I'm for, that that's not my role, right? Or we don't do that, or we can do that, but we're not set up to do that. And and people just don't realize, you know, until you have that conversation about what it is that you're really doing, what your structure to do, uh, because people assume that, oh, well, of course you do pricing, right? I mean, well, no, we don't do pricing. That that's you know, we're not set up for that, for instance. Uh, but it can it can prompt the question though about whether we should be doing it. And should we should we be investing resources in it? So that that's kind of like the you know the front end of like just making sure that everyone's aligned on what is it that finance you know should be doing, and then from that it really does become a case of making sure that we've got alignment on the data. Uh, I'm a big believer in transparency, right? So I don't believe that you know I I, I don't want finance to be respected or feared maybe in the organization because I've got a you know, an information advantage over other people around the P&L and things like that. Uh, I'm a very big believer in like disseminating that widely so that everybody knows exactly where the business stands, where they stand. And then it really becomes about a conversation about the interpretation, right? How do you, how do you use that? And the way you use that then is to kind of take the team and deploy them in a kind of a maybe more surgical fashion. So one thing I really believe in is having dedicated business partners. And in my business, the two kind of key areas would be around product engineering and it would be around sales and marketing so having dedicated folks that actually work with them on a day-to-day basis help them make sense of where the numbers are where they're trending um, and things like that you know it can, it can be very powerful i want to ask you about ai and uh every part of the organization is looking at how to leverage it and uh finance of course is uh championing the adoption in many ways, many sectors. What would you tell us about this company and AI? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd start by saying, you know, we're, we're in that business, right? So Phenom, basically the, the talent graphing that I talked about, it relies on, uh, you know, I would say AI. Um, so so we, we think that's coming, you know. And from the perspective of the CFO, Jack, I'd say – there's kind of two dimensions, right, about how CFOs should be thinking about impact of AI. The first dimension is at the overall enterprise organization, right? And I think that's important for CFOs to take the lead on. Um, and then there's the finance organization itself as well, right? So those would be the two the two dimensions that I think need to be looked at. Um, you know, on the enterprise level, Morgan Stanley's actually come out with an estimate 
that they think 44% of all jobs in the U.S. are going to be somehow impacted by AI. And that's just in like the next three years, right? So if you look at their estimate and you look at the 44%, you look at the average wage and all that kind of stuff, right? They come up with a number of $4.1 trillion of potential productivity gains or cost savings, if you want to look at it from that perspective, that are going to result from the use of AI. $4.1 trillion is about the size of the German economy, which is the fourth largest economy in the entire world. So, you know, what, what we're really looking at here is kind of growing the U.S. economy by the size of Germany in maybe three years because of AI. So, you know, so the impact cannot be understated. But what does that really mean? When you think about that $4.1 trillion, I did some back of the envelope math. If all that kind of flowed back into, you know, the, 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 let's say, the, the, you know, the, the, the S&P 500 and companies on the stock market, what you end up with, is if you've got a company today that commands a superior multiple in the market, you know, because they may be generating 25, 30% operating margins, that means you're going to have to be at 50, 60% plus, right? So if you're going to be a 25% up margin company, which today, by the way, is fantastic, you're getting the top multiple, that's not going to be the case if you're not at a 50 or 60. So I think from a CFO perspective and making sure that they're really in tune with enterprise value creation, things like that, they should be looking at that enterprise level and how do we deploy this, what does it mean to us? Mm-hmm. Kind of, you know, taking it down a notch, um, you know, if you look at it from the perspective of, um, you know what, you know, I mean, how, how do you do that, right? I mean, first of all, what it really goes to is when you think about the 44% of jobs changing, it actually goes right to what Phenom believes, right? Which is like the fundamental nature of work, it's changing, right? So the way that we used to go out and track, recruit, grow, retain workers, that that's not going to work in the, in this new, you know, scenario. And I think the critical kind of, you know, success factor for companies in the new world is going to be matching skills to work rather than resumes to jobs, right? Which is, again, what we're all about, as I discussed earlier on. Uh, you know, and if you look at it from the perspective of, you know, just the finance perspective, that there's a huge opportunity, I think, just to automate tests and things like that as well that, that CFO should be looking at. Great. Thank you for that as well. And we'll jump to our finance strategic moment question, where we're just looking for one moment of insight that you've experienced along the way in your career. We know you've had a couple of these already today, maybe. Uh, at the same time, we're just looking for one that you can share with our with our listening audience. What comes to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? You know, for me, Jack, is probably actually when I joined, uh, joined Phenom, right? So if you think about my kind of transition into the company. I, I accepted the job and decided to come here uh, when I'd say the software companies were having a moment, right? So there, there was just no multiple that was too high. There was no end to funding. Uh, you could happily run a, a, a company with cash flow negative or cash flow burn. Um, and there's just like no end to funding available for you to do that. Uh, within the first few months of getting here, the whole world changed, right? We know that those multiples kind of crashed. Rates started to go up, so it became a very different world. And, you know, the finance moment for me was kind of coming to terms with, okay, do we kind of assume that this is going to be a temporary dislocation in the markets and things will go back to the way they were in 2021? Because that had happened multiple times, you know, since 2008, you might say. Or is this a fundamentally different place that we're in? And, you know, typical finance guy decided let's kind of prepare for the worst and hope for the best, right? And what preparing for the worst meant was we had to get this company to cash flow break even uh, because the company had never been cash flow break even in its history before then. Uh, But I had a very strong fundamental belief that the only way to kind of survive and, you know, kind of go through this period of uncertainty would be if we controlled our own destiny. Because what you don't want to do is you don't want to go out and have to raise money when basically the markets are frozen or there's just a lack of availability of credit or, or capital, or you don't want to do a down round and things like that. The only way you can really kind of go through that unscathed is if you control your own destiny. So we set about putting the company on a path to uh, – to cash flow break even. A number of things we had to do around that, but happy to say if we sit here today, I'm very confident we're going to be at least cash flow break even, if not uh, if not cash flow positive by the end of the year. From episode 936, this is One Minute with Michelle Hook, CFO of Pertillo's. You know, we did time and motion studies in our restaurants. 
and we spent a lot of time looking at um, those type of aspects, gathering a lot of data, looking at the conveyance in the kitchen and all those things. And yeah, we're, lo and behold, you know, in the back half of 2024, we're going to build a much smaller restaurant. And it's going to have not only benefits on the cost side and the return side for investors, but on, on the team members end, it's going to be easier for them to work and convey. And, and a Portillo's kitchen is very long and it's big. And so getting that engine right in the car was super important to us. Well, thank you for that. And we'll jump to our mentoring round where we'll ask you several quick questions intended to inform Mm. and inspire future finance leaders. Uh, We're wondering about the first time you stepped into a a CFO role, Devender, and what it is that if you could just go back and tell yourself, there must have been something when you arrived in the role for the very first time that something you wish you knew, something you thought you, you know, looking back now, you realized if only I had understood that more. Anything, what what would that have been? You know, probably a mindset uh, kind of an issue, Jack, right? So looking back to that first time, you know, it's okay to fail. You know, just because you're the CFO doesn't mean you have to succeed at everything every time. Um, and in fact, what I would say is if you're not, taking calculated risks and failing, you know, you, you're, I don't think you're pushing hard enough against the constraints. You're playing it safe. Uh, you're also kind of missing out the opportunity to like learn some very valuable lessons because I would say, you know, it's through failure that you'll learn, uh, you know, kind of some of those valuable things that that you're, uh, that you're ever going to learn. And, and related to that, I would also say, you know, it's important not to assume that you're the problem, right? So things will go wrong. They'll go off the rails. And I think finance people tend to be introspective by nature. They tend to think about what could I have done differently? What what does this mean? And I, because of that mindset, I think we tend to shoulder blame unnecessarily, right? And there's other functions that are very good at basically either just having a blind spot around their own, you know, kind of call it, you know, shortcomings, or maybe they're just very good at, you know, projecting onto others. Um, and we, we can become the brunt of that, right? So I, I, if I could go back, I'd tell myself, just, just make sure you kind of like, you know, look out for where the problem is and don't be afraid to speak up. Davinder, we'd like to ask our guests to reflect a little bit on the personal side for us. Is there something that most people generally don't know about you? Um, yeah, okay. You know what? I, I hit, So I think most people, actually all people that know me today, would think that I'm very comfortable kind of being around people and doing public speaking and just being, you know, extra. I've actually be, I've actually had clinical, uh, you know, kind of those executive uh, assessments done where I've come off the charts uh, extroverted. Growing up, I was like super, super shy, and I still have that, right? So there are moments where, you know, what people don't see is I need to go back and recharge, right? So there's a part of me that basically needs to go back recharge so I can almost like go back out into the world and, and do what I do, uh, you know, the way they do it. Along your professional journey, when did you begin to become less so or understand that about yourself to perhaps modify your behaviors in some way? I'll make a guess. You arrived at IBM and you were kind of maybe still a little bit shy in, in certain ways as an executive um, and not perhaps in the minds of some demonstrating leadership capabilities in your future. How did you break out of that? Where were you? Were you 10 years in? When did it happen to you? Yeah, you know, I, it probably started like that that 10 to 15, you know, kind of in that range, right? It's probably gradual. You know, I don't think it was like I woke up one day and suddenly I, you know, I changed. And I think it was a combination of basically just, you know, over time, you kind of, you know, see situations play out. And you kind of know in your mind, you know, kind of how you feel about situations. And over time, you kind of like, I was right about that. I should have spoken up. I was right about that. You know, you get enough of those experiences and you kind of get that confidence that, you know what, I've, I've got a 90% success rate here or hit rate. You know, I, I think I'm okay here. And the other part of it was, quite frankly, being around people that were more senior than me, doing the kind of jobs that I thought were very high and saying, I can do that. What do they have that I don't have? You know, so yeah. it's the combination of those two things that came together that just kind of, you know, and I think you know, at some point, 
I, I decided, you know what, I don't want to live my life in fear. I'm going to take some risks. Or I'm going I'm to talk up. You know, what's the worst <laughs> that can happen? And what I found was when I began to do that, uh, good things happened as opposed to bad things. And then that becomes a very, you know, a very kind of addictive thing in its own way. So that that's kind of been that journey. Well, thank you for that. We, we uh, always like to ask if you have a book selection or it doesn't have to be a business book, it might be something you escape with, something that's influenced you in some way. Anything come to mind? Yeah, you know, I, I wrote a book called The Happiness Hypothesis uh, by a gentleman named uh, J- Jonathan Haidt. And he's a, uh, he's a psychiatrist, if you will. And the book's all about like, how do you find happiness? What is happiness? How do you find it? Where is it? And it, it was quite eye-opening for me, you know, in a number of ways, you know, and no, no real earth-shattering, you know, kind of wisdom in there, but it's kind of just a confirmation of a lot of things that, you know, maybe you suspect in life, but you just need to, to read it. Enjoying your day well, more, just taking, living in the present? What, what, I, there... You know, it boils down to living in the present, right? And I do think no. a lot of times, you know, we tend to get caught up in, well, where do I want to go? Where do I want to take my career? Where do I want to take the company? Mm-hmm. And, you know, you get hung up on all that stuff and you kind of forget to enjoy today, right? Yeah. Well, said another way, you know, the, the real excitement and the real fun is the journey, not the destination, right? It's another way of saying the same thing. But he's got a lot of really good ideas about how to maybe kind of, you know, stay present. You know, obviously there's things like meditation and stuff like that. But one of the ones that, you know, I, I the, one of the tips I picked up was just feel your toes. You know, kind of make a conscious effort to feel your toes. It brings <laughs> you right back to the present, uh, you know, when you find yourself drifting yeah. away. So, so you know, that, that, that's that been a great, you know, kind of a personal book. Uh, you, you know, on the other side, from a professional perspective, there's probably a couple of books, you know, that I would recommend anyone that's aspiring to the role, you know, pick up and, and, and try and read. Uh, you know, what one's kind of for your left brain, one's for your right brain, right? The, the left brain or the uh, the hard skills one would be a, com- a book by McKinsey called Value, The Four Cornerstones of Value Creation. Really kind of helps you understand how value is created, how you conserve it, how you grow it and things like that. Um, great ideas for like how to do all of that stuff. And then the other one is a book by a couple of Wharton professors called The Art of Woo. And this book's all about persuasion. It's all about selling your ideas to stakeholders and things like that. Yeah. And I think about yeah. that as a companion, those two as companion, vol- you know, kind of volumes, if you will, because one gives you great ideas and insights about how to kind of run the business, but that's not enough, right? You got to then go sell those to people that it matters to. And together, I think that's a great combination of, of books to have. Nice. I, I don't think we've had uh, all three before. So thank you for those. Always great to get new uh, new books on the shelf. Uh, We are up to our final question where we'll like uh, to ask you to look forward finally uh, and share with us your priorities as a CFO for the coming 12 months. What would those be? Yeah, you know, you asked about capital structure at the beginning of the call, Jack. So, you know, I think the next, uh, call it capital event for us would be an IPO, right? Some some time away yet. Uh, But my job is going to be to kind of get the company to be ready as an IPO uh, candidate. So there's a lot of work that goes into that, right? Just a good you know, I call it 18 to 24 month process, whether it's around governance, whether it's around better predictability and being able to describe the business and things like that. So a big part of what, what I'll be focused on will be that IPO readiness and, you know, be make, making sure that we're ready to go as soon as uh, the windows open up for us. Devinder Athol, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. My pleasure. Nice to be here. Thought Leader listeners, as you have perhaps already heard or even seen, we're now featuring the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our CFO guests as Thought Leader videos. You can now find these videos on our blog at CFOThoughtLeader.com and of course our newsletters, but also on LinkedIn. If you haven't already, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader LinkedIn company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.